Uh, I want to reiterate that, like I said before, and now you're really kind of feeling it, um, I'm not here to teach you every verse and everything. There are a lot of questions that you've had, some we've answered, some you still might have. That's okay. We provided those ESV study notes. Um, you can grab a commentary on Hosea. Uh, there's, still, there's still more work to be done. So I'm not trying to do all your work for you tonight. Um, my goal is to show you the main point of the book, the main point of the sections, and just kind of the flow of thought in each section for you to kind of get your wheels turning on how you're going to teach that to your group and seek to help them apply it, okay? Um, Dean asked a really good question. How would, what would we kind of then do with our groups now? What, what, what would you suggest? Um, just to kind of reiterate some things. I would encourage you to have your group. Let's say you're going to meet, again, a week from tomorrow, okay? Eight days from now, Monday. Um, I would encourage you to say, we're going to be in chapter 1, verse 1 of Hosea through chapter 2, 1. I'd encourage you to read that section a few times. Make some notes, write down some questions, see what it's saying. So, you're not giving them homework assignments that you're going to grade, but, but you're getting the text at least in their head at an introductory level. And then you are a Bible study teacher, that's your title, or <laughs> small group leader, whatever you want to call yourself. You're going to then come and walk them through what's happening here. And so you're going to say, um, in this third lesson here, uh, the theme here is, or the title here is, taking heed to the charges. God is going to lay some charges out against Israel, and he really wants them to pay attention. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight, from chapter 4, verse 1, to 5.15. And you're going to walk them through the passage, like you, again, like many of you have been doing for years now. But I've kind of given you a little bit of some heads up and connected some dots for you here tonight so that you can kind of get down, you know, down the road in your own study and your own understanding of the text. So encourage your people to read that coming section a few times. Notice any, um, you know, questions they might have, observations they might have. Uh, maybe they even think of some good applications ahead of time. So they're going to come ready to some degree. And you know what it's like. Some people, you'll say, hey, I would encourage you to read this a few times, and they'll read it 12 times. And some will say, ah, oh, I couldn't read it. That's okay. The ones that did may profit a little bit more, but that's okay. You're going to walk them through the passage. So then you teach it however you teach it. Some of you teach it, and it's kind of like a preaching type of thing. No one talks, and you walk through the text. That's okay. Some of you do dialogue teaching. Um, Okay, so I want to ask you all, what do you, you, give me an example of such and such, or uh, you involve the group. However you do that is however you do that. I'm not trying to change that, okay? Um, but what you will be doing, what is uniform, is you showing them the purpose of the passage and the purpose of the book, and even following the outline that we've given you. So we at least know, in 30 different Bible studies in the next few weeks, going through Hosea 1.1, through 2.1. We at least know that we're going to be saying this is the point of the passage and here's how he's breaking it down. Now how your group applies certain things, different areas, and maybe not, they can't apply the whole text to every week, but you're kind of really focused on maybe faithfully coming back to God after sin as opposed to kind of trying to hide some sin and come back to God. Maybe that's what your group kind of just starts discussing that night. That's okay. Every group will be talking through application differently. And if some of you are in groups, you're in a men's group and you're in a small group and you're studying both, those groups are going to say the same thing about the text. You're going to teach the same thing, but they're going to be different discussions. You've got different people, different hearts, different, <coughs> different responses to different truths here. Okay, so encourage your group to read the lesson a few times beforehand. Um, you've got my outline. You've got the purpose. Um, answer any questions they might have, and then fourth, help them bring the 8th century B.C. truths into the 21st century. What does God want of Israel's heart? What does he say about Israel's sin? What does he want about from our hearts? What does he say about um, our sin? What is God's character there? We know he's unchanging, so therefore, what's his character here? And maybe you talk through things like, and Matt, this is helpful to hear from you, maybe you talk through things like, what can we praise God for? How can we confess? What can we thank God for? What can we trust him for? Okay, things like that. So I'm trying to give you some understanding as to the points of each of these sections where God is kind of, you know, 
what God's showing us. And then you are then kind of packaging that and then shepherding your people with, with that truth. Okay? Um, and please, I wrote these suggested questions down for you to kind of take that truth from the 8th century BC into the 21st and to kind of give some discussion prompts. You can use all of those, none of those, your own, whatever you'd like there. Okay, it's just for you to use. For, use. Any more questions about that portion? Not about the text so much, but about kind of that leading a group through this. I know it's, this is different. This is a different thing that we've done, but we think that there are some benefits of doing it this way. Uh, we're all kind of saying the same thing about the passage <laughs> as opposed to kind of willy-nilly, you know, yeah, our group went and bought a bunch of trumpets. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever it may be. Okay? All right. Okay. Let's go to the next section. Two more left. Hosea 4, 1 through 515. Um, page 35. I'm calling this section, Take Heed to the Charges. Take heed to the charges. Pay attention to what God is charging you with. Okay, is the idea. Um, can we have a volunteer to read some of this? Everyone, thank you, Jeff. All right. Um, so, Jeff, if you could read 4 1 through just, just chapter 4, Jeff, and then can someone else read 5? Anyone read? Okay, Steve, thank you. So, Jeff, if you can read, stand up and read chapter 4. Steve, if you can read chapter 5. We'll get it into our heads before we dive into it. All right. Again, I mentioned uh, the title here Take Heed to the Charges. I'm going to show you why. I believe that's the theme here. Um, I want you to notice a number of common things. The verse, the passage starts out, chapter 4, hear the word of the Lord. Go down to the beginning of chapter 5. Hear this, O priests. Later on in the verse, give ear, O house of the king. And then down in can't keep this all on the same screen. If I did it like that, I could, but then you can read it. But if I go down to 5.8, blow the horn in Gibeah. Now, again, I kind of joked, some people like to take that and make application. All right, I've got to go buy trumpets. The, the horn here is like an air raid siren. Everyone be on alert. It's happening now. Take heed. Pay attention. So, Hear, hear, blow the horn. They're all saying the same thing. Pay attention, pay attention, pay attention. And we get one more. Sound the alarm in Beth Avon. So there's a theme here. Pay attention to what God is saying. Now, this word here, controversy, in the very first um, verse of chapter 4, Lord has a controversy. That right there is a legal term. Um, think of divorce court, if you will, or, or any court. Um, there are some charges being read. So God's got a legal controversy. He's going to read off what the northern kingdom, and we see in this passage, evidently the southern kingdom is learning from their sinful ways. The Lord's going to read the controversy, read the list of what they're doing wrong. And all sprinkled throughout the beginning of four is listen beginning of five, listen, sound the alarm, sound the alarm. So that's why I get the title, Take Heed to the Charges. Pay attention to what God's saying. All right? Um, we get in chapter four a list of their sins, highlighting the sins in yellow. No faithfulness, no steadfast love. I'm going to breeze over these, but these are things if you want. You can camp out on these things in small group. No knowledge of God. Now, I'm going to circle this one because I told you it comes up quite a bit. We've already got that in the previous section. It's going to come up more. No knowledge of God in the land. Back to our highlighting the list. Uh, there is swearing, lying, murder, stealing, committing adultery, break all bounds, and bloodshed follows bloodshed. It just keeps getting worse and worse. Therefore, the land mourns and all who dwell in it languish. We know kind of a timeless principle. When people sin, 
it affects everything, right? Oh, my sin's just a private matter. No. It affects your family. It affects your church. It affects everything. Um, all who dwell languish. Also the beasts of the field and birds of the heavens. Even the fish of the sea are taken away. We know the creation groans because of sin. Yet let no one contend. Let no one accuse. Now, so far, this first uh, few verses, 4, 1 through 3, uh, we're looking at the sin of the nation largely. And then he's going to zero in on the leaders. Mainly the priests in 4.4, 4, let no one contend, let, no, let none accuse, for with you is my contention, O priest. He goes to the leaders of the nation. Now the nation's sinful, they're being rebuked, but the priests are being dealt with here. Verse 5, you shall stumble by day, the prophet also shall stumble with you by night, and I will destroy your mother. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. This people did not know their God. They claimed to know him. They claimed to be his. But they really did not know their God. Destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge. Why do the people not know their God? Because the priests don't think it's important. The priests are rejecting the knowledge of God. They're not teaching the people the knowledge of God. You know, when the southern kingdom comes back under Ezra and Nehemiah, there's that great passage in Nehemiah 8 where Ezra reads the law. People are hearing knowledge of God and his ways and they repent. But here, this northern kingdom, they're rejecting knowledge. The priests are rejecting knowledge. The, the people don't know knowledge. And when you don't know God, you don't care to know God, your actions follow. And what follows sinful actions? Negatively affecting everyone else. So you could say at the very beginning, it starts with knowing God and knowing him rightly. Let's move down to chapter 5. You can go through the, all the lists, the rest of chapter 4, and see all the iniquity. <clears throat> chapter 5, again. Hear this, O priest. Pay attention, O house of Israel. Give ear the call, again, to pay attention to hear. And then go down to verse 4. Their deeds do not permit them to return to their God. They are far gone. For the spirit of whoredom is within them, and they know not the Lord. Again, repeated for us. So what things do you see repeated so far? You see, they don't know God. They don't know God. They don't know God. They don't know God. And you also hear, pay attention, God's speaking. Now the track record for them to obey that command isn't a good one. They're not listening. They don't know God. Their priests aren't even teaching about God. And now God's saying, pay attention to me. Not likely. But he's still saying it. Listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. All right? Now let's go down to 513. What's happening in this paragraph? We see two options. Two possible responses, okay? You haven't been feeding people the knowledge of God, you priests. The people don't know God. They don't know God. Listen, pay attention, sound the alarm, (laughs) take heed to what I'm saying. And now you see what they do in response and what God calls them to do in response. So there are two two ways this could go. Take, Take your children. You haven't been listening to me. 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 Listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. What happens? What happens with Israel? Look at 513. When Ephraim, another word for Israel, their biggest tribe, okay, this is Israel. When Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah his wound, then Ephraim went back to their God. Nope. They went to another savior. They went to Assyria and sent to the great king. They sin in the same way with someone else. But notice what God says. He's not able to cure you or heal your wound. Now listen, Assyria was the United States of the day. They were the world's superpower. 
or China, if you feel better with, with that, okay? <laughs> they were the world superpower. Listen, if we've been, we've been losing flax and wool, we don't have as much as we used to. Um, what do we do about that? Correct answer, Hosea. Go back to God. But they say, I got an idea. A priest probably came up with it or a prophet. Let's go try to cozy up to Assyria. Assyria is the superpower. If we're kind to them, we can benefit from all their goods. Now surely, in that day and age, Assyria, if they wanted to, they could benefit any other nation. But God is stronger than Assyria. And God says, he's not able to cure you or heal your wound. He can't fix, he might fix your food problem, he can't fix your spiritual problem. Don't go from one sin to another sin to get out of the first one. Go back to God. For I, God speaking, will be like a lion to Ephraim and a, like a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear and go away. I will carry off and no one shall rescue. I will return again to my place. So they keep doing this. They're going to be punished again and again and again. They're, gonna, they're, they're turning against me. They're going to be punished until... Now, here's option two. Option one is the wrong one, going to Assyria. Option two is the right one, and it's not the one they do, but it's the one that God desires. Here's what God desires. Until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face, and in their distress, earnestly seek me. Now that word earnestly is key. Because we saw in the last section, they, they're seeking him. I'll go back to my first husband as they stuff the little images of Baal in their pockets. No, no. That's not earnestly seeking God. That's just trying to kind of have your discipline over with. They're not earnestly seeking him. This is what God wants. Acknowledgement of guilt, seeking his face, seeking his presence, his approval, earnestly seeking him. They, like I said earlier, it's not just that they want more goods and services to be easily provided for them. They want him again. And so far, it seems like the nation doesn't want him again. They just want the wool supply to keep continuing. Or whatever Assyria can offer them. So this, this section ends... <coughs> this, section, this section ends with possibilities... Priests, no one knows the Lord. That's your problem and theirs. Pay attention to me. Pay attention to me. And they go, uh, we'll go try Assyria. And God says, I want you to acknowledge your guilt. So coming back to God admits what you've been doing wrong. Acknowledge your guilt. Seek my face. Earnestly seek me. Not just what he provides, but earnestly seek to have him back. Those are the two options, and they choose the first. But maybe they'll come around. Maybe they'll come around and start seeking him. I leave that as a cliffhanger for the next section. Okay? Let's go to uh, the suggested questions. Page 46. <coughs> Here are... Uh, a couple places you could take your people. Use all these, none of these, whatever you'd like. In 4.1 and 5.1, God calls his people to hear and give ear. Later in the passage, Israel goes to other saviors. What makes it hard for us to listen to God's rebukes when we are wayward? I think that's a good discussion for a small group to have. What makes it hard? Pride, embarrassment, Shame, not wanting to change our ways. There could be a lot of reasons. Second, why does the Lord speak of the land <coughs> mourning? Uh, my answer would be that I think God's trying to show the consequences of sin. Sin always has consequences on others. Always does. Well, my sin is private. No one knows about it. Okay, does it take you time to do that sin that you're engaged in? Oh, yeah. 
okay, then people aren't benefiting from your time. <laughs> Sin does have consequences. The private ones that you think no one knows have consequences on their people. It affects your prayer life, certainly. God's not going to answer prayers when we're holding on to sin. We know that. So when you say, my sin doesn't affect anyone else, well, your prayer's being answered. Uh, if you were not keeping anything from him, if you were confessing to him, living rightly before him, nothing between you and him, I think other people would benefit from your prayers. So, again, why does the Lord speak of the land mourning? Because sin affects others. Sin affects everything. He's trying to show that. Number three, how should leaders in the church, in the family, work, whoever they are, how should leaders respond to the indictments given to the priests? What were the people lacking from them? What were the people lacking from them, first and foremost? Knowledge of God. Knowledge of God. And even, uh, I know there's a, there's a debated phrase here. Um, I'm looking at it from a different Bible, so I don't know exactly where it is. Um, oh, verse 8 of chapter 4, they feed on the sin of my people. Um, there's a translation question there. I think it's they feed on the sin offering of my people. The people are bringing a sin offering and the, and the priests, kind of like they do in other places in the Old Testament, are taking more than their share. They're getting rich off of the sin of the people. <laughs> hey, the more they sin, the more meat they bring, and hey. <laughs> so th these priests, like the priests of Ezekiel 34, uh, they're in it for themselves. So there's a selfishness there. And they're not feeding the people the word of God. They're not teaching God's ways to the people. Uh, number four, sinful pursuits never permanently satisfy. Chapter 4, verse 10. Explain how the pursuit of a particular sin in the past failed to satisfy you. That could be something that, you know, some people might not want to answer, but some might. There was a time when I pursued alcohol or pursued career, and um, I thought that it would continue to satisfy, and it didn't. I think it's good for people to hear those testimonies. Um, so that could be something you ask. Five, how have you seen sin to be contagious? How have you seen sin to be contagious? Again, that's a good discussion to have <laughs> in a group. Six, why do you think there's so much talk of not knowing the Lord in this passage? Seven, instead of returning earnestly to the Lord, have you ever ran <coughs> from one failed source of comfort or security to another source of comfort or security that also failed you? Explain, if, if you'd like. <laughs> but but think, think of a new believer. If someone said, you know what? I went from this sin to this sin, and I still wasn't satisfied. It still hurt me. That's good for a new believer to hear. It's good for younger people to hear in our small group. Or someone thinking of going from this sin to the next. Okay. There are times where we go from one sin to the next. We stop this, but we, instead of going back to the Lord, we go back to something else. You, can, you might be thinking, what are some examples of that? I'll leave that to you to ask your group. There are examples out there. All right? As you lead this study, anticipated questions, page 48, with other people you know, what questions might they have? Any questions about leading the group? Anybody have any Questions that you've thought of that you could ask the group based on this passage? Any of those? I know I'm springing that on you kind of in the moment. Daniel. Good. That'd be a great thing to flesh out. Yeah. The, the smaller the group, again, even if it's gender specific, the more kind of intimate you could be with some of that stuff. But in general, you know, groups can answer these things generally and be a benefit to one another. Um, and, and all these things you talk about, these can be things that as you're leading the group, you're kind of noting, like, those are good things to pray about. And you don't always have to pray at the end of a small group session. You can say, oh, you know, 
Pat, that's a great thought. Let's all pray right now. <laughs> Can someone pray that we wouldn't, you know, think that our sins are private and don't affect anyone else? I mean, you can just pause and pray at any point in your small group. So these are good things not just to discuss, but then return to the Lord. Sometimes in our small groups, we're getting this real good heart stuff, pointing one another to faithfulness, um, the faithfulness of God, examining our own hearts, getting that all on the table, and then, okay, what are the prayer requests? Uh, my mailman's goldfish has a disease, and let's pray about that. Oh, man, <laughs> we're going downhill real fast. Like, that's an okay thing to pray about, but why don't we bring these matters that we've been discussing to the Lord first and then pray for a flipper, you know, after that. So, okay? So, so try to take your prayer time and make it profitable spiritually. Go before the Lord there, not just turn it all of a sudden into something that kind of is different than we've been doing for the last hour, you know? Any other thoughts, questions, observations? Yes, Jason. That's a really good thought. Um, here's why I've encouraged you all to read the passage 14 times. And some of you might ask, where does 14 come from? When I start to teach a book, I sit with it for at least two weeks. How many days are in a week? How many days are in two weeks? 14. Okay, so that's where I get 14. All right? Read it once a day for two weeks. It's not a magical number. Like, man, 14, is that somehow... Did Noah do something 14 times? No, it just represents two weeks of sitting with a text, okay? So it's not magical. But the benefit of you reading a text over and over again and someone asking in real time and space here in the third section of Hosea, what does it mean to earnestly seek God? The answer is in this book. It's in chapter 14. He tells us what he, the kind of repentance he wants. Do you want me to spoil it? Or not? Okay, turn, turn to chapter 14. No, 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 hold on. Don't, don't turn yet. Don't turn yet. What's that? I'm going to tell you to turn That's so good. <laughs> okay, okay. I'll tell you, but just in a few minutes. Okay, all right. But my point is, there are connections in the book, and if you've read it through, um, you'll start to see things come up. The, I think this is good Bible teaching. I think, I think not so great Bible teaching is just you saying, oh, we're going to study Hosea. I'm supposed to teach Hosea. Okay, let me just start. What, what's chapter 1 about? You will know a lot more about chapter 1 if you read 1 through 14. You will know when you get to the end of this section, which is the end of chapter 5, when it says, earnestly seek me. You will know God gives the prescription for that in chapter 14. That's good to point people to when you're in chapter 5. Okay, so thank you, Jason. Good point. The text does answer this. Okay.